welcome everyone to episode 4 of the Biologic Podcast. Today, I'll be discussing a unique class of self-reproducing biopolymers called nucleic acids. Nucleic acids can, and most likely did, form in the hot, mineral-rich environments of the primordial Earth. They have been observed to form in places as inhospitable as deep sea vents and volcanoes. It's largely believed that nucleic acids were the first self-reproducing molecules that bridged the gap between chemical evolution and biological evolution. If you recently listened to episode 3 about proteins, you should be familiar with the concept of polymers, basically a chain of monomers that are all connected together. Just like polypeptides, nucleic acids are biopolymers. While the monomers in a polypeptide are called amino acids, the monomers in a nucleic acid are called uh, nucleotides, or uh, ribonucleotides. Ribo, as you probably noticed, is the prefix in ribonucleic acid, or RNA. DNA has a similar structure to RNA, except the DNA has two complementary strands, while RNA uh, only has one strand. And DNA lacks the hydroxyl group bonded to its two prime carbon that RNA has. Because DNA lacks this oxygen atom, it carries the prefix 2 prime deoxyribo. DNA is thus the acronym for 2 deoxyribonucleic acid. Both types of nucleic acid share the nucleotides adenine, guanine, and cytosine. The fourth and fifth nucleotides are used by only one type of nucleic acid. Uracil only exists in RNA, and thymine only exists in DNA. Both RNA and DNA typically exist as long, string-like molecules. Unlike sugar polymers, nucleic acids do not branch off one another like the branches of a tree. Instead, they exist as strands, or independently replicating DNA, called plasmids. Bacterial DNA doesn't organize into the long strings and clumpy chromosomes that characterize eukaryotic DNA. Additionally, both endosymbiotes and complex life use circular loops of DNA, Mitochondria, the energy-producing structures that exist in the cells of all complex life, use loops of DNA instead of chromosomes. Chloroplasts, an endosymbiote in, uh, in plant cells that produces energy through photosynthesis, also uses loops of DNA. The eukaryotic cells that house mitochondria and chloroplasts, however, use, uh, they use linear DNA molecules that get wound up into dense chromosomes. Every nucleotide is composed of three parts a 5-carbon pentose sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. The 5-carbon sugar takes the form of a pentagon made from 4 carbon atoms and 1 oxygen atom. The 5th carbon atom is not in the pentagon. Instead, it's connected to a carbon atom in the pentagon that's immediately adjacent to the oxygen atom, jutting off uh, out of the ring, out of the plane of the ring. As you might be thinking, it's pretty difficult to describe the positions of atoms within a ring in a way that isn't confusing or overly descriptive. To manage this problem, the atoms, usually just the carbon atoms, in a ring are numbered. The fifth carbon atom, the one poking up from the plane of the pentagon, is numbered 5, or 5 prime. The carbon atom it bonds to is numbered 4, called 4 prime. Carbon atoms 3 prime, 2 prime, and 1 prime compose the rest of the pentagon. Carbon 1' prime and 4' prime both sit on either side of the oxygen atom. Carbon 1' prime and 5', prime, the one sticking out of the pentagon ring, are both binding sites for the other parts of the nucleotide. The 1' prime carbon binds to the nitrogenous base, while the 5' prime carbon binds to the phosphate group. I covered the phosphate group briefly in episode 2. Uh, it's a phosphate atom that shares 5 bonds with 4 oxygen atoms. As a result, Three of the oxygen atoms carry a negative charge, making the molecule itself very negatively charged. One of the oxygen atoms bound to the phosphate atom gets rid of its negative charge by binding to the 5' prime carbon. Carbon 1' prime, on the other hand, binds to a small group of molecules called nitrogenous bases. These are molecules with one or two rings composed of carbon and nitrogen atoms. With one exception, each nitrogenous base has one or two carbon atoms with a double bond to an oxygen atom. The nitrogenous base is like a little flake of organic matter, heavy on the nitrogen with some degree of variability. There are two groups of bases, called pyrimidines and purines. The pyrimidines are composed of a six-point ring, while purines are composed of two rings, 
basically a hexagon sharing a side with a pentagon. Recall the numbering system that I mentioned earlier. This numbering system can be used on any ring of atoms, including the purines and pyrimidines. Let's start with the pyrimidines, because their shape is simpler. Imagine a hexagon with points at the top and bottom. The top is a nitrogen atom, which we'll call 1'. This 1' prime nitrogen is the atom that binds to the 1' prime carbon of the ribose sugar. So in your hexagon, keep in mind that the 1' prime nitrogen atom connects to the backbone. The rest of the nitrogenous base more or less extends from this atom. From starting at the top, the ring is numbered clockwise. The 1' prime atom is the nitrogen at the top, so the 2' prime atom, a carbon atom, is at the next clockwise point in the hexagon. The numbers continue in this direction. 3' prime and 4' prime are carbon atoms. 5' prime is a nitrogen atom. And 6', prime, the last point in, a in the hexagon before coming back to the top, is a carbon atom. In each pyrimidine, a double bond connects the 2' prime and 3' prime carbon atoms in the ring. Purines can be numbered in pretty much the same way. Recall that purines are composed of two rings, a hexagon sharing sides with a pentagon. Imagine another hexagon, numbered in the same way as the pyrimidine hexagon. The 1' prime atom at the top and the 5' prime on the lower left side are both nitrogen atoms. The 2' prime and 3' prime carbon atoms in the hexagon share a double bond, and both are shared with the pentagon. Imagine a pentagon attached to the right side of your hexagon. In more technical terms, this basically means that a 3-atom bridge loops out to form a second connection between the 2' prime and 3' prime carbon atoms of your hexagon. This bridge is also labeled in a clockwise fashion, starting with the first atom immediately adjacent to the 2' prime carbon. This first atom is labeled 7', prime, followed by 8', prime, then 9', prime, which then connects back to the 3' prime carbon in the hexagon. Three pairs of atoms within the purine's two-ring structure share double bonds, the 6' prime carbon and the 1' prime nitrogen, the 2' and 3' prime carbons, and the 8' prime carbon and 9' prime nitrogen atoms. The 7' prime nitrogen in the purine is the atom that binds to the ribo sugar, as opposed to the 1' prime nitrogen in the pyrimidines. If you listen to the third episode about proteins, recall that polypeptide chains are composed of amino acids, these are distinguished from one another by their R-group side chains. In a similar way, the nitrogenous base distinguishes nucleotides from one another. The DNA uses four nucleotide bases, guanine and thymine, adenine and cytosine. RNA uses the same bases, except for thymine, which it replaces with a similar pyrimidine called uracil. Each nucleotide base can be referred to by the first letter of its name, G, T, A, C, and U. Guanine and adenine are both purines, while cytosine, thymine, and its RNA replacement uracil are all pyrimidines. So how do these nitrogenous bases vary from one another? What are their differences? Recall the numbering mechanism and ring structures I described a moment ago. Let's start with the purines. Guanine has an oxygen double bound to its 4' prime carbon and an amino group bound to, to, uh, bound to its 6' prime carbon. Adenine, the other purine base, only has an amino group bound to the 4' prime carbon. Now consider the three pyrimidines. Remember that the pyrimidine core structure is just one hexagon, which is stuff branching off of it. Cytosine has an amino group on its 4' prime carbon and an oxygen atom double bound to its 6' prime carbon. The 5' prime nitrogen atom in cytosine doesn't have a hydrogen atom bound to it. Instead, it shares a double bond with the 4' prime carbon. The other two pyrimidines, thymine and uracil, they both have a hydrogen atom bound to their 5' prime nitrogen atoms, and only one double bond between the 2' prime and 3' prime carbons. Thymine, the base used in DNA, has two oxygen atoms, one each double bound to the 4' prime and 6' prime carbons. Thymine also has a methyl group, a carbon atom saturated with three hydrogen atoms attached to its 3' prime carbon. Uracil, the base used in RNA, is remarkably similar to thymine sharing every quality except the methyl group. Because DNA is double-stranded, the bases fit together to form complementary pairs. Each pair consists of a purine and a pyrimidine base, which fit together with a few snug hydrogen bonds. The bases in each pair connect like a puzzle piece, their physical geometry is smoothly fitting together. Adenine and thymine, A and T, pair together just as cytosine and guanine, C and G, 
pair together. The AT connection has two hydrogen bonds, while a GC connection has three hydrogen bonds. This makes the GC connection slightly stronger than the AT connection. Long stretches of GC sequences in the DNA are harder to unzip, and they play a role in regulating DNA expression. I'll discuss this in greater detail in future episodes about DNA replication, transcription, and translation. So the nitrogenous bases, uh, the subunits that identify the entire nucleotide, are the parts involved in information storage via coding, and they're also responsible for holding the two DNA strands together with their hydrogen bonds. The other two subunits of the nucleotide, the 5-carbon sugar base and the phosphate group, bind together to compose the backbone of the nucleic acid. Just like the amino and carboxyl groups are involved in the polymerization of polypeptides, the phosphate group and the sugar are involved in the polymerization of nucleotides. The bonds that hold the nucleotides together in this polymer chain are called phosphodiester linkages. Phospho because of the phosphate atom, and diester because of the two esters in the linkage. In biochemistry, an ester is an oxygen atom that's bound to two non-hydrogen atoms, usually as part of an alkyl group. In the phosphodiester linkage, the phosphate atom in the middle is bound to four oxygen atoms, one with a double bond and another with a single bond, which gives the oxygen a negative charge. The other two oxygen atoms are connected on either side of the phosphate atom, forming the linkage. These oxygen atoms are the esters, because each one binds to the phosphate atom and a carbon molecule in a different nucleotide. There you go, that's the phosphodiester linkage. Through these bonds, the repeating pattern of ribose sugars and phosphate groups composes the backbone of the nucleic acids. The reaction that produces the phosphodiester linkage is a condensation reaction that requires enzymes and ATP. The hydrogen atom bound to the oxygen on the 3' sugar carbon is removed, as is the hydroxyl group bound to the phosphate atom. These removed atoms combine into a water molecule while the oxygen atom on the 3' carbon of one nucleotide now bonds with the phosphate atom of another nucleotide. Just as with proteins, this condensation reaction fuses monomers together to create links in a chain, the chain being the polymer. Okay, so that was a lot of information, so let me do a quick recap. DNA and RNA are nucleic acids. They're biopolymers composed of sequences of four different kinds of nucleotides. The nucleotides bind together through a condensation reaction to form phosphodiester linkages involving the phosphate group and the sugar molecule of each nucleotide. The complementary pairing of bases in two nucleic acid strands is called Watson-Crick pairing. A DNA molecule is very stable because of the fact that its two strands are held together with a zipper of hydrogen bonds. RNA is less stable because it's a single strand and it possesses a reactive hydroxyl group on the sugar. In order to access the information encoded in the CGAT sequences of DNA, an enzyme called DNA helicase needs to unzip the DNA strand by breaking all these hydrogen bonds. I'll discuss this as well in future episodes about DNA replication, but for now I'm going to just stick with the structure and basic functions of the nucleic acid molecules. Alright, so now it's been established that the backbone is a repeating sugar phosphate pattern. This pattern gives the molecule a particular characteristic called directionality. One end of the nucleic acid molecule is a ribose sugar with an intact hydroxyl group called the 3' end, named after the 3' carbon that the hydroxyl group is attached to. The other end of the molecule is a phosphate group, attached to the 5' end of the ribose sugar, so this end is called the 5' end. In cells, new nucleotide bases are only added to the 3' end. So in writing out a DNA sequence, one writes in the 5' to 3' direction. Each strand of DNA is anti-parallel. This means that if you were to lay out a DNA molecule flat on the ground, the 5' to 3' directionality of one strand would run in the left to right direction, while the directionality of the other strand would run in the right to left direction. Each double-stranded DNA molecule is about 2 nanometers wide, or 2 billionths of a meter. That's really small like a hundred thousand times thinner than a human hair or small. The distance between each nucleotide base is 0.34 nanometers. Every 10 bases, or 3.4 nanometers, the DNA helix has one full rotation. The DNA molecule is twisted into a helix for several reasons. 
The hydrogen bonds created in the anti-parallel complementary pairing contort the strands into a helix shape. Additionally, the hydrophobic nature of the nitrogenous bases encourages a helix shape in an aqueous solution to reduce contact with water molecules. The sugar phosphate backbone, however, is not hydrophobic and will readily interact with and dissolve in water. This double-stranded hydrogen bond sealed helix makes DNA an amazingly stable molecule. Its lack of a hydroxyl group makes it much less reactive than RNA, which increases its durability. DNA's stability also makes it an ideal storage vessel for hereditary information. DNA, however, cannot replicate itself on its own. DNA cannot catalyze any reactions. In order to replicate, DNA requires a whole suite of proteins. Because of this, it's believed the DNA evolved after RNA. Because unlike DNA, RNA can catalyze the reactions in the protein suite that are necessary to replicate itself. What is it about RNA that gives it this ability. Where DNA lacks a hydroxyl group, RNA possesses one. This hydroxyl group makes RNA much more reactive, allowing it to participate in, for example, uh, condensation reactions. The nucleotide base on RNA, which includes A, C, and G, and U instead of T, can engage in complementary base pairing just like DNA. Unlike DNA, the single-stranded nature of RNA allows it to fold back on itself and bind its own complementary sequences together. The double-stranded sequences can twist into a helix, just like DNA, and create what are called hairpin loops. When the RNA strands fold back around to bind with itself, it creates a sequence of unpaired bases that loops between the two paired sequences. This unpaired sequence is called a hairpin loop. Because the bases inside the loop are unpaired, and thus exposed, they can participate in other reactions or bind with free-floating proteins. RNA can also replicate itself. Loose nucleotide bases floating around the solution are attracted to the exposed bases of the RNA. With hydrogen bonding, the free bases pair to the bases in the RNA, on what is called the template strand. The sugar phosphate backbone fuses together with phosphodiester linkages, creating a double-stranded RNA molecule. An enzyme, or just a good dose of heat, will break the hydrogen bonds, splitting the strands apart. The newly synthesized strand is complementary to the template strand. If the newly synthesized strand were to be used as a template for another new complementary strand, this second new strand would be identical to the original template. In this way, RNA can store information, although its reactivity and susceptibility to degradation make it a subpar format for long-term storage. A long RNA molecule can undergo folding like the tertiary structure of, of a polypeptide. The RNA strand folds in a particular configuration, clumping together like a protein to become an RNA protein equivalent called a ribozyme. The ribozyme is an RNA strand folded into a globular shape with the capacity to catalyze other chemical reactions. Ribozymes have been observed to catalyze the formation of peptide bonds and phosphodiester linkages, among many other types of reactions. If RNA molecules can catalyze the formation of the bonds critical to proteins, and to the bonds in their own sugar phosphate backbones, then RNA molecules might have been able to replicate themselves. This is why many biologists believe that RNA might have been the first self-reproducing biomolecule to exist. It would then stand a reason that DNA evolved from RNA as a more stable, long-term storage mechanism for hereditary information. These hypotheses about the first self-replicating biomolecule have led many researchers to study RNA and ribozymes to see if they can find one such molecule capable of reproducing itself. In experiments that study the chemical evolution of nucleic acids, researchers induced various mutations in a group of RNA molecules and exposed them to free nucleotides. Any RNA molecule that was able to catalyze phosphodiester linkages between the free nucleotides would start to surround itself with a growing pool of short RNA sequences, using its own nucleotide sequences as a template strand. These RNA molecules that exhibited replicative behavior were isolated and themselves replicated, creating a new generation of RNA molecules that had both a sensitivity to self-replication and a new group of mutations. The mutations could make the replicative capacity of the RNA molecules better or worse, 
and the better ones were again isolated and replicated. In this way, through generation after generation, the researchers grew RNA molecules that were undergoing a form of artificial selection. These experiments, however, only succeeded in creating RNA molecules about 10% the length of the ribozyme. Creating a longer RNA molecule has proved to be significantly more difficult than expected. This unsolved problem in biochemistry has led some researchers to doubt the hypothesis that a ribozyme was the first self-replicating molecule. This isn't to say that it's impossible, just that it's unlikely. We don't really know for sure what molecules were in the primordial soup. We don't really know what level of sophistication existed among RNA molecules. The ribozymes created in labs through successive generations of artificial selection don't really exist in nature anymore if they even did in the first place. The ribozymes created in labs through successive generations of artificial selection don't really exist in nature anymore if they even did in the first place. In modern cells across virtually all organisms, ribozymes are involved in the construction of proteins. This suggests, at the very least, an order of descent in the primordial soup. RNA most likely preceded proteins. Consider the conditions of the early Earth that I mentioned so often. The genesis of organic molecules seems to occur in energetic places, places exposed to heat, energy, uh, gases, and mineral substrates. Deep sea vents are one such place. Boiling, sulfur, iron-rich gases perpetually soak the mineral-encrusted interior of the vents. This supplies a constant stream of chemical and thermal energy to the organic molecules within the vent, namely nucleic acids and proteins. For cells to exist independently of this constant energy stream, they needed a way to store energy such that it could be transported and used later. Without these energy-storing molecules, the first cells couldn't have lived for very long outside the warm mineral walls of their deep-sea vent. The solution to this problem came with the evolution of a particular class of molecules called carbohydrates, which I'll explore further in the next episode. That's it for episode 4 though. I hope you learned something cool about nucleic acids. I mentioned several things in this podcast that require much more explanation. Stuff like transcription, translation, and DNA replication, but that will be covered in future episodes. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy the podcast, tell your friends, tell your teachers, tell your classmates. Hit the like button and subscribe so you can see new episodes when they release. The Biologic Podcast is kept alive by the support of listeners like you. If you want to help support the podcast, please consider buying some merchandise in our official store or becoming a patron by visiting our Patreon page. The official Biologic store can be found at redbubble.com slash people slash biologic slash shop. In the store, you can buy merchandise like t-shirts and coffee mugs and hoodies. All the products have really cool biology-themed artwork on them that I've designed myself. The official Biologic Patreon page can be found at patreon.com slash biologicpodcast. The support of Patreon patrons is very important for the show. Longtime patrons are rewarded with exclusive episodes on fascinating topics and will have their questions prioritized in AMA episodes. Thanks for your support, and as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.